Holly, thanks so much for joining me today. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to see you again and to join you. Great. Well, I'm excited for our conversation. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so we'll jump right into it. But I like to have all of my guests start by introducing themselves and their companies and give us the background of how you got into the business and how your company, Green Cities, came to be. Sure. Um, My name is Molly Bordenaro, and I'm one of the four owners and managing partners of the Green Cities Company. Um, The Green Cities Company uh, started out as actually a development company um, in around early 2000s and quickly became one of the leading development companies on the West Coast for ESG, was one of the first developers of high-rise multifamily to be LEED certified, um, right when U.S. Green Building Council was starting. And so we've continued to push the envelope. Um, I actually joined the firm. Um, I had helped finance some of their deals um, early on. Um, And then I joined the firm in 2009, in February 2009, right after the great financial crisis started, um, as a way to kind of recapitalize and move the firm, leveraging their expertise into real estate investment management. It was really born out of the idea from the great financial crisis to um, buy broken condo deals for cents on the dollar and then be able to um, utilize the development expertise to convert those into multifamily um, and go vertical as multifamily while still maintaining the great development expertise in ESG. Very successful in terms of our early funds. And then... um, actually bookended by kind of, you know, national crises right around the time of the pandemic. We um, were in the process of negotiating buying out the original development partners and the four main partners of the firm who had built the investment management group completed the buyout of our retired development partners and subsequently rebranded the firm as the Green Cities Company. Now, along that way, we had um, grown into a robust investment manager with about two billion of assets under management. Really focused on multifamily, um, both value add and ground up development with a series of value add funds, and also separately capitalized development vehicles. Um, and also maintaining kind of our leadership in the industry with ESG and further pushing it into new areas around health and wellness and equitable communities um, and um, carbon emission reduction. So super proud of the firm we've developed and grown and looking forward to the next chapters. Well, I have the benefit of having spent time with you previously and know that you have an interesting background prior to coming to Green Cities or Girding Edlin. Uh, can you give us a little background about your life before Green Cities and what you were up to and how that informed your career um, you know, more recently? Um, well, I actually grew up in the industry. My father owned one of the largest commercial brokerage companies in Portland, Oregon. It was independently owned at the time before there were big national brokerage firms. And so I think I went to work in the industry around the age of 12, which um, spending my summers filling out on three by five cards, the market research in the Portland, Oregon office market, actually going, walking downtown and going into all the office um, companies and asking them when their lease expired and what square footage they had and filling it out really before even everything was computerized. Um, But it really gave me such a deep appreciation for the impact of the built environment in terms of communities um, and As a result, I went through kind of um, an aspirational path to move into not just the broker side, which I started in, but really wanting to be a part of the ownership side to help impact how kind of communities and neighborhoods are. Um, But I very much had an equal passion for seeing that our communities thrive and grow. So this combination between real estate investment and also um, real belief in kind of community impact. So one of the first funds I started was was a new market tax credit fund. And that's when I first financed a couple of 30 Needland developments. Around that time also um, maintained involvement and kind of 
public policy and politics and um, was asked to serve as a U.S. ambassador under the Bush administration. So took time out to do that um, between 2005 and 2009 was um, asked to serve in the country of Malta, which is, was a wonderful experience, but it gave me a larger platform in terms of really understanding kind of the intersection of um, public policy, business, finance. Um, and during that time, I um, certainly started talking to the owners of Gertie Gerd- Needlin about their next iteration and my vision for moving into real estate investment management. Um, and right at the end of my tenure was right when the great financial crisis started. And, you know, it certainly wasn't an opportune time to launch into real estate investment management. But with every disruption in kind of economic cycles, there are opportunities that are born out. Um, and we're certainly hopeful that that's the case right now, too. Let's talk a little bit about Green Cities and uh, dive into some of the details of the organization. So you mentioned that uh, you have about $2 billion of assets under management and you have a um, a series of funds and co-investment vehicles. Let's, you know, can you give us a little bit more detail in terms of uh, your current active funds, the capitalization in terms of institutional or high net worth or both, uh, as well as the size of the organization. Are you vertically integrated? You know, what do you do? What do you outsource? Kind of what does that look like? Because every investment manager is a little bit different. Sure. No, great questions. Um, Because our origins were in development, the whole strategy was to build kind of a, a a very deep vertically integrated real estate investment management firm. So we maintain um, both um, development expertise, but we're really expanded on the design side as well with that in-house expertise, in-house asset management acquisitions. Um, So we really have the full scale of capabilities over any investment life cycle um, from the start of the acquisitions to the management, to the value add creation or the ground up development all the way through um, disposition to hit our targeted returns. Our investors are all institutional capital, um, predominantly pension fund capital, but we do have foundations and endowments as well. Our value-add funds um, have been right around the size of $400 million in equity with about um, you know, 60% debt. So each of the funds are about a billion or a billion, over a billion of um, total capitalization. We're in the market right now with our um, fifth value add fund, um, which we're targeting a raise of 450 million. In the early days, um, we had development pocketed in to our value add funds when you could underwrite for a really strong unlevered yield of about 200. Um, spread over um, kind of stabilized yield. Um, But as the cycle from 2008 moved forward, we pulled our development expertise out and we do those in separately separately capitalized vehicles now. Um, And we not only have kind of that full scale of expertise in-house, but as I mentioned earlier, one of our deeply embedded expertise is surrounding ESG. And as we rebranded the firm and bought out our retired partners in 2000, we deepened our commitment to ESG with our own proprietary Green Cities Index. Um, And what that is, is it takes five pillars of what we feel are important in terms of driving into each of our properties around ESG. It's the environmental footprint of each property. Um, It's resiliency carbon emissions reduction, health and wellness, and equitable communities. And we have really deep metrics and KPIs that we measure each of those properties. And through kind of our CapEx strategies at the value add side, really drive strategies around each of those kind of pillars. And then with our development, we are actually um, moving towards getting to net zero on the ground up development side. Everything we focus on now is multifamily. Um, we are national in our footprint. We tend to focus on markets that are really tied to um, traditionally kind of life science and tech, um, but we're incredibly opportunistic and data-driven in terms of um, what markets we target and then deeply embedding kind of our knowledge with people on the ground in those markets. So I was going to leave ESG to the end, but I had a feeling that I would get it pulled forward in this conversation. And I think it's really timely given both where the markets are and given that 
the two of us are talking, there's a lot of headlines about ESG and it's become a topic that has been uh, uh, hotly debated in the political environments and the business environments uh, and more specifically within the real estate community and the real est- institutional real estate community. So can you share with us kind of why or how did ESG become so interconnected to green cities from your founding? And then what does ESG mean to you today? And let's try to demystify some of the kind of headlines that we hear about what is ESG and why it's good or why it's bad or what it means. So maybe you can kind of give us the 100 level overview. Yeah. I mean, I think ESG is a, is a word that has um, taken on a definition that people really um, understand different from just kind of what the actual um, letters ESG stand for. And it really, for us in multifamily, means creating a place where people want to live that matches their values, that matches their values in terms of wanting to be in a place that has cleaner air and biophilic design, which is impactful to mental health and really, um, you know, encompasses in terms of the neighborhood and area that um, has access to outdoor activity or health um, and, you know, matches their values around environmentalism, both in a very practical sense in terms of just having EV charging stations or in a very real sense in terms of actually a building that performs better in terms of its actual energy use or carbon emissions. Um, And also with equitable communities, really understanding the strength of diversity within neighborhoods and celebrating that in how you design your buildings and how you also interrelate to the other vendors in that direct neighborhood. Um, All these things really drive value in our assets. And that I think is so what is critically important for real estate investment managers to understand if they're going to do ESG right. Because if you do it right in your property, you're actually driving value. And for every ESG strategy that we do in our properties, we actually do a return on cost assessment. And that return on cost is different. If we install solar at one of our multifamily properties, We understand what the energy savings per kilowatt is going to be. And that's a direct impact to saving energy costs, which actually reduces your operating expenses, which improves your NOI. But if you're doing something around being able to improve air quality and test that, being able to market that to your tenants, to market that to potential tenants, really drives both tenant retention or leasing occupancy. Or if you're doing things around resiliency or certification, which encompasses everything, you're actually driving value on the disposition side because that is becoming incredibly desirous of other real estate owners, especially around, you know, being able to point to a low carbon emission building. Um, And so there's all sorts of different metrics that we look at and encompass but 100%, and third-party statistics show this in terms of what tenants want and what they're willing to pay for, or what they're willing to choose among other options in the marketplace. But it is very real in terms of how people choose where they, where they live, work, or play. And in the case of multifamily, there's nothing more important than where you're living. So recently, we've seen a number of institutional investors come out and make statements about the critical nature of getting to net zero or only making investments with sponsors that have uh, minimal, you know, minimum thresholds or minimum requirements for ESG. What would you say to those GPs out there who might argue that, or the investment managers out there that might argue that this is merely greenwashing and it's politically motivated and it's really not necessary? Um, Do you have, like, I'm sure you have these conversations with your peers from time to time because we know those groups exist. What's your reaction to that? Well, I mean, listen, there's been a lot of movement in the marketplace towards wanting to move towards um, being able to claim as an investment manager that you're net zero by just talking about your corporate headquarters or doing it with carbon offsets. And that's really not where we focus. 
Um, and we're very authentic in terms of focusing at the direct real estate investment at the property level, try and reduce carbon emissions. And so there's a number of strategies that we go through and to accomplish that at the value add side, which is just through electrification or other kind of energy generation, you can actually reduce carbon emission. Now, when it gets to net zero on ground up development, that is a very hard thing to accomplish. And you really have to be authentically there on scope one, scope two, and scope three, which encompasses all the way through to the materials that you're bringing in to the building that you're building. Um, we have a team that spends all their time focusing on that. We're very confident that the assets that we build from the ground up are one of the lowest in the industry for multifamily carbon emissions for multifamily properties. And we're very confident that we'll eventually get to net zero. But that's all the way through scope three in terms of materials, which takes kind of a broader marketplace, but we're investing the time and research into that. And I mean, we continue to have these conversations where with investors, and there's many large institutional investors, which are savvy and understand and are on board of trying to get to how we solve this in terms of real carbon emission reduction at the property level. But that's that's the place where we're focused. Um, and we're really enthusiastic about the rest of the industry getting there. And we're happy to continue to have those conversations to help the industry get there. Um, but that's kind of where our focus is moving forward. Great. Well, I appreciate that context on ESG. Before we move off the topic, I want to cover two more items here. One is you reference certifications. I believe that you have assets that are both LEED certified and fit well. There's also reporting standards such as GRESB. Can you help talk us through how you uh, comply with or uh, adhere to these different standards that are exist in the market and how you see those evolving over time? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's there's multiple different reporting standards. There's GRES, there's UNPRI. Um, you know, now they're moving towards carbon emission standards through CREM and others. Um, and with certification, there's LEED certification and FITWELL certification. The purpose of all of these is really to try to get a place of um, sharing knowledge and transparency in the marketplace, whether it's transparency with your renters or with your investors or with the broader community. And, um, you know, it takes a lot in terms of just the rigor of going through all these, but but they're valuable. They are valuable. And, um, you know, I talked earlier about how purposeful we are in terms of the five pillars in our Green Cities Index and the KPIs that we measure on you know, an ongoing daily, monthly basis um, in terms of a lot of these outputs and, and, and measuring. So since we're doing that already in real time and we produce our own annual environmental and community impact report around those KPIs, a lot of them are transferable then. And I think if you're in real estate investment management, if you're building that type of capacity and capabilities around that data management, and by the way, that data is really important because we constantly analyze it to make sure our assets are performing as intended. Um, then it becomes easy to meet all the different kind of reporting standards or reporting vehicles and certifications. Um, and we value and appreciate how important they are to the marketplace um, and to our tenants and our investors as well. So when we talk about ESG, you mentioned earlier, and I agree with you, it's a uh, it's a it's a acronym that means different things to different people. The E is the environmental component. We spent a lot a lot of time talking about the environmental component. How do you think about the S and the G, and how is that reflected through your business? Well, I mean, the S is social, and it's it's. It, it starts with, I mean, first of all, we're a minority and woman-owned business. My main partner is a minority. I'm a woman. So, you know, our whole DNA is kind of focused around social and understanding the impact of and importance of diversity, not only through our own company and corporate structure, but how do we demonstrate and value that at the property level? And whether it's creating 
universal design, which is really accommodating to more people or more genders or um, how people identify themselves in terms of genders or um, whether you're using, um, you know, minority and women vendors, which we tend to measure at all of our properties, vendors that service our properties, or how do you engage with the neighborhood um, to increase participation and highlight maybe minority or women-owned businesses in the direct neighborhood of your multifamily properties. I mean, these are just some of the examples, but I think what's important is just understanding the success of our properties and understanding the success of our firm and being committed to that because there's so many more kind of optionalities around the social side. Um, And then with governance, it really is about being authentic and transparent. And we talked earlier about just the, you know, the robust amount of reporting, but that's part of good governance. Um, You know, I know we're going to talk at some point about communication with our LPs, um, but first and foremost, that's where good governance starts. And, you know, we've been a member of Juniper Square for a long time. And um, I think what you guys offer in terms of communication is such at the heart of that G and and good governance Um, and just being able to create the opportunity for investors in real time to leverage everything they need in terms of their investment. Um, it's, it's, that's really kind of the G and we're constantly striving for that best practices. I'm glad to hear that. And we appreciate the feedback. It is interesting because green cities is a little bit different than some of our other customers in the sense that, you know, Juniper square helps support, you know, general communication with your investors with a specific focus on communicating financial returns. And Green Cities is so heavily focused on that. But additionally, you have um, uh, infrastructure in place to support your non-financial returns in terms of your, you know, environmental uh, and sustainability work. So it is interesting to think about how Green Cities defines governance as communication more broadly, both in terms of the financial and non-financial. So let's take that as a jumping off point and talk a little bit about kind of how you think about investor communication, but more specifically, how have the needs of the investors that you serve today, how have their needs changed, you know, over time through multiple cycles? Well, there's no question that there is a growing demand for increased communication from investors, and and rightly so. Um, And that's been really driven by three things. One has been the ease of communication, really, which has been delivered by companies like Juniper Square to be able to give that type of real-time information, um, not just on the financial return side, Um, But we use just your email capabilities to investors in a certain fund to give them a direct update on something that significant has happened, a new transaction, a sale, um, kind of, you know, the expiration of the investment period, those kind of things. Um, And so, you know, technology has really driven that um, to be able to create that. The, The second thing is data and the amount of data that is now available. and. Um, it is critically, it is one of our deepest values in terms of using data to help make decisions and whether we're looking at what market we're moving into. Um, and we have a proprietary heat map that takes into account 20 different metrics in every market that really drives, is this a good market to invest in? And sharing that data now with investors, there is a deep interest in um, on their part to understand the why of investment decisions and really peel back the strategy. And so the increase of data is another reason that's kind of increased kind of their demand in that. And then the third is just the volatility in the marketplace. And we certainly have seen, you know, so much volatility over the last 36 months, the last three years between COVID and now the movement of interest rates. And so being able to talk to them about um, how you're mitigating risk around that, what you're doing in order to address kind of the changes in the marketplace, as well as um, your forward outlook of the changes in the marketplace and and what you think is going to happen both in terms of the multifamily asset and the greater economy. Um, so this is really what's driving kind of that um, rapid increase of kind of communication that investors are looking for. 
Um, and we just are really um, cognitive of that. And we try to sit in that space at all time um, to deliver that to our investors. And is this a new phenomenon or is this a spot? Is this a space where, you know, you feel that Green Cities has always been a leader? Obviously, technology and services like the ones that Juniper Square offers have only been around for the last, you know, six, seven years. But what what did life look like before technology to help you with your investor communication and reporting? Well, it's made it easier. I mean, it's made it much, much easier. And so, you know, I, I've seen tremendous growth. Juniper Square was not around when I first started the real estate investment group in, you know, 2008, 2009, or maybe you guys were just starting. I know we were one of the early um, participants with Gen- Juniper Square to, to utilize your guys' platform. Um, but, you know, I think, listen, we've always been a mid-sized firm that prides ourselves on being very entrepreneurial. And part of that entrepreneurial spirit not only makes you better investors in terms of looking at changes in the marketplace and having um, the flexibility and the ability to make changes, to learn from, you know, to to be introspective and very self-aware, and then to be opportunistic. But it's doing that across the board, not just in investment opportunities, but how do you become better investment managers? And that's always looking at kind of being from an entrepreneurial mindset of how are we, how do we still become best in class in terms of servicing our investors, servicing communication to them, being proactive in our communication, um, delivering the type of data and research that they, they really want to know. I think that's great. And I think, you know, the world is, is obviously changing all around us and we can all acknowledge that uh, the only thing that seems certain these days is uncertainty. So let's change gears and talk a little bit about some of the kind of uncertainty that exists in the macro environment. And then we'll drill down into the types of assets that Green Cities owns and manages and operates. So here we are, you know, last year, uh, the end of last year was tumultuous to say the least. Interest rates spiked up. Uh, you know, lending basically came to a halt. Where are we today? How do you see the lay of the land? And what are you looking out or where are we today? And how do you see that changing over the course of the next, you know, 11, 12 months, the balance of this year? Well, I mean, listen, we're in a very good place because um, our funds were able to hold through some of this volatility. Um, there's no question, um, as we've seen all assets be hit in values um, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. The same thing is potentially happening in private real estate. Now, the interesting thing is it hasn't happened in private real estate because a lot of people have well, there hasn't been a lot of transactions to really, um, in the last six months, to really drive kind of that comp data to do significant or even smaller write downs. Now, a lot of funds are going to go through year end third party appraisals, and there's no question that cap rates have moved. And so we are going to see um, kind of that hit to valuations at the end of the year. I don't think the good news is, is that those. Um, investment managers that were really focused on risk mitigation and have good communication with their investors um, and are willing to be able to or can extend through this period, um, either with their debt or their caps on floating rate debt or with their fund terms or investment periods, um, then I think they're going to be fine. But out of this, there's going to be investment managers who took on more risk, who took on more debt, who took on more unprotected floating rate debt, um, who are going to be challenged. We're already starting to see that. We just actually made our last investment in our fund four, um, and we were able to get an unbelievable um, asset at a very low cost basis with a high yield um, that I never thought I would see a yield of six plus in multifamily, one of the top tier markets um, for a class A asset um, that has now become very value add just because of its yield. But, you know, those are where the opportunities are going to be. And so we are raising the capital in Fund 5 to be really strategic 
about taking um, advantage of those. Now, it's really interesting because a lot of it, it's very, to do deals right now, it's a lot of work. You're you're either going after deals that decide not to trade, but then come back around, or you're doing them off market um, without a broad marketing campaign, because broad marketing campaigns are pretty painful right now. Um, and so our acquisition team is really good at just how deep they, their market knowledge is and knowing who the owners are and what kind of constraints and taking advantage of, you know, what does come out. So I think there is going to be opportunity in 2023 and we're going to see it. Um, but I also think, especially in multifamily, now office is a wholly different asset, um, but in multifamily, industrial, um, you're going to see a lot of investment managers that might get a, a, a write down, just be able to hold through. And in multifamily, we are predicting we're still going to see NOI growth. We're not going to see rent growth like we did the past two years, but we're predicting above 3% nationwide in terms of rent growth. You know, occupancies are still going to be pretty solid. We're still in a really good place in terms of supply demand balance in most markets. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not doom and gloom on multifamily. I'm pretty optimistic, and especially for investment managers who's really paid attention to mitigating risk. Um, I think they'll be fine. Well, I think you said a few things that resonate with me, starting with the valuations and, you know, kind of right sizing portfolios, which I think will come as Q4 valuations come in. And I know that there's always a debate between, you know, asset owners and valuers in terms of how do you get the pricing right in the absence of a lot of transactions, which is the market dynamics right now. Um as you think about the last transaction, the one that you mentioned as a case study, and I realize it's a sample set of one, you know, can you walk us through, you know, you don't need to disclose the location or, you know, anything that's confidential, but what were the mechanics of that deal? How did the deal come together? You mentioned, was it, was it an off-market deal? Was it a distressed seller? Um, was it institutional, an institutional owner that needed to get out or a, a family? And then, you know, what, what did the world look like as you went out and tried to arrange financing for this asset, assuming that, you know, there was leverage, uh, that there was a levered deal? No, all good questions. Um, it was an off-market transaction. Um, it was, we have a very close relationship with the brokerage firm. Um, they know about our certainty to be able to close um, just because we have discretionary control over equity um, and our really good ability to um, be able to secure debt. Um, because we have in-house development, we're also very solid on being able to do due diligence on any physical asset. And so even before we go into contract, our ability to assess kind of the physical risk of any asset um, is a little bit deeper than, you know, most real estate investment managers. Um, and so we have a very good reputation in the marketplace in terms of um, as, as closers um, and have built that over the last you know, dozen years. So the asset was really brought to us, um, knowing that this owner had to sell um, because of their fund was coming to an end. And, you know, they had explored the marketplace and gone and broadly marketed it. Um, so we were aware of the asset, I think in the summertime and when the price came in about 20% below what they were asking, they had took it had taken it off market thinking, let's see. Um, then they came to the conviction that, you know, the market's not going to change any time before their fund expires. And also their debt was expiring um, and they would have to do a pretty significant pay down um, in order to extend the debt. You know, we really kind of underwrote it with what we were looking for in terms of meeting, um, both meeting the market and meeting kind of our expectations and our fund returns. Um, and we're able to come to um, a, a price and it's very advantageous for us. Um, so that's a little bit about that deal and what I think is going to be very representative of deals getting done in 2023. Now, in terms of debt, um, we are doing lower leverage. I think everyone is kind of doing lower leverage. But so I think on this asset, we're doing about 54%, where usually we do 60% leverage. Um, and 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 that's fine. We still feel confident to be able to meet our returns. And you, you so you mentioned it was brought to you off market. You have your in-house development capability. There was debt available, I assume, priced it reasonable. 
levels. Um, were there any, you know, so so just to make sure I understand you correctly, you say it traded about a 20% discount to asking price. Is that right? Or was it deeper? Yeah. And the most important thing when you talk about debt is, you know, we didn't go in with negative leverage um, because it's a six plus yield. And so, you know, we felt really good about that. Um, but um, yeah, I think, well, listen, it's it's 20% below what they were going to do in the summer. I think maybe off from probably what their valuation is in first quarter of 2022, as, as maybe with anyone who's trading right now. Um, but but yes, I mean, th- those are the kind of things that we're looking for. We're, you know, multifamily cap rates have traditionally been um, very low. And so with um, where interest rates are today, um, it's not really palatable for us to take on negative leverage. And so that's one of the things that we're looking for right now is a higher yield. That makes sense. So let's transition and talk about the assets that you own. We touched upon it a little bit earlier, but you're really focused on grade A asset, grade A multi, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're focused on grade A multifamily assets in gateway or major metropolitan markets. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily gateway markets. I mean, we look for certain criteria in certain markets. Um, diversification of industry, youth magnet markets. We're very interested in, you know, the markets that are attracting young, educated people. I mean, I think a great example of that is San Diego, which is, you know, not necessarily a gateway market, but the job creation story there is pretty significant, um, especially around you know, the life science sector, but certainly even diversified in San Diego. Um, and then, you know, there's there's lots of markets that meet that, but then we're also extremely conscious of supply. And so there's some markets that meet that criteria, but we're concerned about what the pipeline looks like. Um, and then, you know, I think that in addition to that, it's it's very much market by market, neighborhood by neighborhood, um, we're really sensitive right now to just what the average area medium income is and what a property's percentage rent is compared to that. Um, so I wouldn't even say that we're focused just on class A, but maybe kind of that more suburban urban piece that would be B plus or just by location more, um, considered in more of that um, workforce housing kind of scenario because we see more opportunity there in terms of demand in the short term. And have you seen any changes to the velocity of leasing or demand for any of your assets as a result of the, you know, degrading macro conditions? You know, that's a really good question because there's a lot of discussion right now on whether or not rent growth is slowing or occupancies are going down. Nationally, vacancy is only 4.6%. So it's very solid. It's kind of reset to pre-pandemic levels. And so it's really hard to tell two things right now. And by the way, we're still seeing positive rent growth on lease tradeouts across our portfolio. It's not double digit like it has been the last 18 months, but it's still positive and still greater than 3% on average. Now, there's two things that it's hard to see. There was a tremendous amount of unbundling of household formations, people moving out of out of living with their parents, people moving doubled up with friends during the pandemic. Um, and certainly that created significant demand over the last 18 months. Now, it's hard to tell if whether or not that has just been absorbed and we're moving towards more normalized rent growth of 3% and more normal occupancy levels. It's also multifamily has become very seasonal. And so we are in the depths of kind of that winter leasing season, which is never um, as active. And it's interesting because coming out of the pandemic, it's almost like the entire population rolled on those kind of um, summer 12 month leases that get done in, you know, May, June, July. Um, It's almost like everyone's on the same lease cycle now more than they ever were. And so it's really hard to tell. Yes, we are seeing slowing in demand. We're still seeing, um, you know, positive lease trade outs. Um, And so it's too early to determine whether or not it's seasonal or if this is momentum that we're going to see after we move through the winter months. So you mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned some of the impacts of the pandemic. When you think about the demographic changes that have taken place, 
and you look at your portfolio, how would you describe kind of the typical, to the extent that there is one, renter profile? And then I want to talk a little bit about kind of what that means for the way that you, you know, uh, develop and manage those assets. Well, I mean, listen, there's some general, um, there's some general commonalities about the renter pool in terms of the rental pools growing and people are getting married later. They're having less children. They're staying renters longer. Um, they're delaying home ownership. Um, it, it was, you know, pre pandemic and during the pandemic because house prices were rising so fast and now it's because interest rates. Um, and so there's, there's more renters by choice and lifestyle and, and then there's, renters because of affordability. And you've seen both of those groups kind of grow. So you've got a larger age cohort that is renting today than ever before in our nation's history. Um, Also, out of the pandemic, you really gain this desire to be um, more transient, to be able to move from city to city. So there's a lot of renters by choice who just don't want to commit to one place or one market. So that's really helped in terms of kind of increasing demand. Um, beyond that, I think it's really market by market driven. And, and I do think you've seen some changes in some marketplaces and um, across the board, you've seen greater demand in some markets um, and you've seen some impact in what used to be high performing markets. Now, what's the only real commonality, and that's really why we drive so much data in terms of creating a heat map and reviewing each of our markets. But I will say um, the more progressive markets, whether they were, it took them longer to come out of COVID restrictions or pre-pandemic, they were already moving towards um, increased crime, decreasing, you know, safety or, you know, actually, um, you know, (laughs) really getting tough on crime or tackling homelessness in certain cities. And I think those progressive cities we have seen have been slower to return or have less of the demand that they had three years ago compared to some other markets. But beyond that, you know, it's been a great, um, you know, 2021, 2022 in terms of, you know, demand for multifamily across the board. Well, that's, that's great to hear. With with the pandemic, a lot of us were forced into a work from home or work remotely scenario. Have you seen any kind of structural changes to the amenitization of multifamily assets, things that, you know, perhaps evolved during COVID that you think will persist that you're now incorporating into your assets? Yes, I, of course. And this is where I am internally grateful that we have embedded just really highly skilled individuals on the design side that drive our CapEx strategies, that drive our development strategies. I mean, one of the things that we are known for is um, whether it's a workforce housing asset or a class A high rise in a downtown urban location, design matters. And it's design in terms of not just aesthetic, but how the building functions for your needs. And so we've been able to, you know, make good adaptions to the increased work from home. Um, And whether it's investing in apartments that have larger unit sizes or um, making sure that we put more common area spaces to work from home. And, And there's a lot of real nuances that we've studied also. You know, our renters tend to prefer to sit at like booths where they can spread out their work. Um, you know, having really good Wi-Fi and outlets and all those kind of common areas. So we have gone through and made changes to those. Um, but once again, this is where a lot of our ESG strategies has become really important because when people are living 24-7 in a building and in a space they really start to care about the health of that building, the air quality of that building, um, your filtration levels, um, you know, sharing that with the tenants. Also, the amenitization around health and wellness. We do a lot of biophilic design in our properties, which is really bringing nature into the buildings. And the third-party studies on what that does to mental health and just reducing kind of parasympathetic response of stress is phenomenal. And we uniquely kind of 
communicate to our tenants to make sure they're really aware of all that. And, um, you know, they value it. And that's why we have really strong tenant retention, much higher than urban multifamily rates across the board um, and and higher occupancy. Um, These things are becoming increasingly a value. It makes perfect sense to me. And I love that you can bring it full cycle from ESG as a headline to how it directly impacts the way that people live in the assets that you own and and have developed. So that's a great, I think that's a great place to wrap up. I want to thank you, Molly, for your time and sharing your insights with us. We appreciate it and look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Brandon.